Hello and welcome. This is my wife, Mary, and I'm Ed, and we are Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. We're excited you're joining us today. We present or expound on a principle or belief related to the SDA Sabbath School Quarterly each week. In this first quarter of 2020, we will be studying the book of Daniel. The first week gives some pointers on how to best understand the book of Daniel. Tuesday's lesson discusses the differences in prophetic communication used by God to his people. The lesson compares what it calls classical and apocalyptic prophecy. It contends that books like Daniel and Revelation are apocalyptic, in which God mainly uses otherworldly dreams and visions to convey his message, versus classical prophecy, where the prophet receives the word of the Lord as the form of communication. Visions can be included in classical prophecy as well, which will typically use true-to-life symbolism. The quarterly lesson then says, these genres show that God uses a variety of approaches to communicate prophetic truth, Hebrews 1.1. So to begin, let's read Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So here we can see that indeed the early Christians were also aware that God spoke to us, always through the prophets, but in various ways and even at various times. Today, we're going to look at this subject as it relates to the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Some Seventh-day Adventists, unfortunately, have unofficially come up with certain litmus tests for determining if a prophet is true or false, whereas other SDAs seem to have no idea how to evaluate whether a prophet is true or false. As we will see, there is actually one test for a true prophet. Sometimes we look for certain methods of delivery, signs, wonders, visions, or physical manifestations to determine the validity of someone's prophetic gift. Is this a good way to evaluate this? First of all, Hebrews says that there are many ways for God to speak to the fathers by the prophets. This is really important because since the time of Ellen White's death, and even before, people have been wondering if there would be another prophet chosen by God to carry on the work as God's spokesperson. If a man or woman claims to have a prophetic word from God, most might reject their testimony if the word they deliver comes differently from the way God delivered his message through Ellen White. Sure, we know that there were times when Ellen White stopped breathing, similar to but not exactly like Daniel, Daniel 10, 7 through 9, and John the Revelator, Revelation 1, 17, but we know that there were many times when Ellen received a word from God and did not stop breathing. We also know that this phenomenon did not occur with most of the prophets of ancient history, like Isaiah or Jesus. Actually, it's never said that a prophet of God stopped breathing while in vision. God spoke to Moses from a burning bush. Good thing that didn't become the burning bush litmus test, or we would never have accepted another prophet after Moses' death. Isn't it true that the Sadducees and the Samaritans did not receive any of the prophets after Moses? That's true. Peter and Paul raised people from the dead. Ellen White never did that. Well, that's true. God even spoke to Balaam through a donkey. That certainly did not become the standard of prophetic delivery. Isaiah walked around naked for three years. Isaiah chapter 20, verse 3. Honestly, what would we think if that happened today? This should be enough to show that there is no certain way that messages and revelations are received and given by the prophet of God, just like Hebrews 1 tells us. But people typically refuse to investigate any further prophetic claims after the death of Ellen White because they have a natural bias towards the way God worked with her. Although this is a natural tendency, we must be logical about this. Let's take visions. Some prophets had visions, some didn't. Consider John the Baptist, whom Jesus said was the greatest prophet ever. He has no recorded visions at all. Ellen White said this concerning visions. She said, I saw that the reason why visions have not been more frequent of late is they have not been appreciated by the church. The church have nearly lost their spirituality and faith, and the reproofs and warnings have had but little effect upon them. Many of those who have professed faith in them have not heeded them. Some have taken an injudicious course when they have talked their faith to unbelievers, and the proof has been asked for they have read a vision instead of going to the Bible for proof. I saw that this course was inconsistent and prejudiced unbelievers against the truth. The visions can have no weight with those who have never seen them and know nothing of their spirit. They should not be referred to in such cases. Some prophets wrote a lot, like Ellen White. Some prophets wrote very little, like Hosea. Some prophets were very pious, like Daniel and Paul. Some, however, were like Balaam. Interestingly, proof of the prophetic gift is actually not based on the claimant's own personal life, as can be seen from Balaam the prophet. Ellen White had this to say about Balaam. She said, 
At the time Balak sent messengers for him, Balaam, he was double-minded, pursuing a course to gain and retain the favor and honor of the enemies of the Lord for the sake of rewards he received from them. At the same time he was professing to be a prophet of God, Idolatrous nations believed that curses might be uttered which would affect individuals and even whole nations. And yet, God used him as a prophetic messenger. Ellen White continues, The Moabites understood the import of the prophetic words of Balaam, that the Israelites, after conquering the Canaanites, should settle in their land, and all attempts to subdue them would be of no more avail than for a feeble beast to arouse the lion out of his den. Balaam told Balak that he would inform him what the Israelites should do to his people at a later period. The Lord unfolded the future before Balaam and permitted events which would occur to pass before his sight that the Moabites should understand that Israel should finally triumph. As Balaam prophetically rehearsed the future to Balak and his princes, he was struck with amazement at the future display of God's power. And now let's consider the prophet Jonah who ran from God's calling and complained about God's mercy in the end. David committed adultery and murder, but God used him both before and after his atrocities. Wow, so it's obvious you can't even determine if someone is or is not a true prophet based on their personal character. Right, think about it. Satan can masquerade as an angel of light because he knows he can trick us by a seemingly pious appearance and then deceive us with his lies. When we are deceived, it's because we believe a lie. Let's not be deceived. So how on earth are we supposed to know if a prophet is true or false? The important thing is the message of the prophet, not the good works of the prophet. You can give or believe any message and be a good or bad person. It is irrelevant. Just because someone is a prophet does not mean that they are going to be saved. It is about the fruit that the message produces in your own life. It is never about the life of the messenger. The prophet is just a human who must be transformed in the same way you or I are transformed by the messages of truth. God is no respecter of persons. We are all judged by the same standard, and that standard is truth. Ellen White said she had to read her own writings like the rest of us do. That is profound. Her messages were from God. They were not her own. Consider this. In Matthew 7, verses 15 through 16, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. So by this, we automatically think Jesus is talking about the fruit of the character of the messenger. But wait, Jesus continues, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So here we can see this group of people have good works and are yet rejected by Jesus. The fruit Jesus is talking about is the fruit the prophetic message produces in your life, not the personal character of the messenger. Ellen White commented on this verse from Matthew 7 in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing in the chapter entitled, Beware of False Prophets, Matthew 7.15. She said, Teachers of falsehood will arise to draw you away from the narrow path and the straight gate. Beware of them. Though concealed in sheep's clothing, inwardly they are ravening wolves. Jesus gives a test by which false teachers may be distinguished from true. Ye shall know them by their fruits, he says. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? We are not bidden to prove them by their fair speeches and exalted professions. They are to be judged by the word of God. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth to error from the words of knowledge, Isaiah 8.20, Proverbs 19.27. What message do these teachers bring? Does it lead to your reverence and fear of God? Does it, the message, lead you to manifest your love for him by loyalty to his commandments? If men do not feel the weight of the moral law, if they make light of God's precepts, if they break one of the least of his commandments and teach men so... They shall be of no esteem in the sight of heaven. We may know that their claims are without foundation. They are doing the very work that originated with the prince of darkness, the enemy of God. Not all who profess his name and wear his badge are Christ's. Many who have taught in my name, said Jesus, will be found wanting at last. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. 
She continues, there are persons who believe that they are right when they are wrong. While claiming Christ as their Lord and professedly doing great works in his name, they are workers of iniquity. With their mouth they show much love, but with their heart goeth after their covetousness. He who declares God's word is to them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. Ezekiel chapter 33 verses 31 and 32. A mere profession of discipleship is of no value. The faith in Christ which saves the soul is not what it is represented to be by many. Believe, believe, they say, and you need not keep the law. But a belief that does not lead to obedience is presumption. The Apostle John says, He that saith I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 1 John 2, 4. Let none cherish the idea that special providences or miraculous manifestations are to be the proof of the genuineness of their work or of the ideas they advocate. When persons will speak lightly of the word of God and set their impressions, feelings, and exercises above the divine standard, we may know that they have no light in them. Obedience is the test of discipleship. It is the keeping of the commandments that proves the sincerity of our professions of love. When the doctrine we accept kills sin in the heart, purifies the soul from defilement, bears fruit unto holiness, we may know that it is the truth of God. When benevolence, kindness, tenderheartedness, sympathy are manifest in our lives, when the joy of right doing is in our hearts, when we exalt Christ and not self, we may know that our faith is of the right order. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments, 1 John 2, 3. The only biblical test of a prophet is the truth of his or her unique message. It is not based on signs and wonders, as those can be false, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8-10, through 10, which reads, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth, and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. In this verse, we are told not to trust in signs and wonders, as they can just as easily be from Satan. Do we consider Ellen White a prophet because she could hold a heavy Bible at a 45 degree angle for an hour? Is it because she stopped breathing sometimes when in vision? Of course not. It is because her message was truth. It produces righteous living for those who hear it, take it to heart, and put it into practice. Well, we hope this gives a firm foundation for the evaluation of prophetic claims, past, present, and future. There is much more that we could say concerning the gift of prophecy. We have more videos in the end screen for you to consider. We are here to tell you that there have been five prophets sent to our church since the death of Ellen White. But don't take our word for it. We invite you to investigate these messages for yourself. Taste and see if these messages promote righteousness in your own life. Thank you for staying with us through the entire video. We invite you to visit our website, www.bdsda.com, to learn more about who we are and, just as important, who we are not. Please join us each week as we will continue to offer new and interesting insights for your Sabbath School studies. God bless. Many blessings.